Hey friends, everyone, thanks for tuning in. This is Eric KJ for YZI with Ham Radio Concepts. If you're a subscriber, thanks for tuning in. Click that like button for the effort. If you're a newcomer to the hobby or a newcomer to my channel, now's a good time to click that subscribe button, turn on notifications, give a thumbs up for effort, and follow along and learn something about this vast hobby we promote as amateur radio. Now in this video, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna start to talk about two meters. Um, in the past for my subscribers that follow. I did do a video about a month and a half ago of each one of the HF bands one video at a time showing you exactly what you'd be able to expect from each one of the bands. Well I did say in the midst of all these other projects I got going for video I did say I would make a video on 6 meters, 2 meters, 220 or 1.25 meters and 70 centimeters. Now these videos are going to be in the same format so let's get to it. We'll talk exactly about what you can expect from these different bands and I do have several videos that I will put in the links on my channel about 6 meters and uh, 6 meter antennas and 2 meter antennas and stuff like that. Now I'm going to start on this one by saying this. Uh, 2 meters, I can make this one a little bit longer because there's a lot of content for 2 meters. If somebody, okay, a newcomer to the hobby can get on ham radio, the first thing they usually do is get on two meters, VHF. It's the first thing they do. An excited person will grab a handheld, whether it be a $30 Bofung or a $300 Icom or a $400 Yesu or whatever, and they can get on two meters with a technician class license, the first license you'll get. And that's great because you have a place to get your feet wet. You have plenty of people to talk to. You have plenty of, of options to get on two meters. It's probably the easiest and most inexpensive band to get on. Now with that being said, if somebody tells you as a newcomer, if they tell you you don't want to stick on two meters because it's nothing but talking to the repeaters and your range is only line of sight three miles. I, I love hearing that. Your only range is line of sight so you'll be lucky you can get two or three miles. Well you're probably right theoretically in a technical aspect but let me tell you this. I'll show you a couple antennas in this video that I have. I will show you a couple uh, cool things about this band. Yes, you can make contacts over a thousand miles away on sideband. Yes. And this is coming up to the time of year that you'll do it. I've worked 300 miles away on a mobile in my mobile situation or mobile setup. I've worked mobiles that were 300 miles away from my base antenna. I've worked sideband all up the east coast to North Carolina and such. So and I know plenty of people that have as well. So two meters is not just your three mile range handheld and let's get into it. This is two meters VHF 144 megahertz band for amateur radio. Taking a look at the U.S. amateur radio bands chart from the ARRL as we have in the past with the previous HF band videos and it's available online for you to print out, put on your wall, as you learn and get familiar with ham radio. Now, 2 meter band spans from 144 megahertz to 148 megahertz. Technician, general, advanced, and extra class all enjoying the same operating privileges across the entire band. And a lot of the newer technician class licenses have told me, when I bring it up and talk with them and try teaching them and elmering them, they, they weren't even aware that sideband and CW existed on this band. They always thought sideband and CW meant HF and FM meant VHF, you know, two meters. That's not the case. There's Looking at this chart here, there's a lot of stuff going on, and I'll have to break it down in another slide here shortly on the bandplans.org to show you just how much stuff is going on two meters. For instance, in the bottom portion, very bottom, CW only, there are severe enthusiasts that de dedicate their life on two meters to do CW, to do moon bounce, to do digital modes, sideband, and such. And those are, I think one is the Florida Weak Signal Society. Uh, they do a lot of that. Now, so you have CW down here. Then you have your sideband that starts at 144.2, which is the calling frequency, and it spans up a little ways. Then you have a section for packet radio, digital packet, APRS, uh, wind link email over VHF, you know, position reporting on APRS, packets for emergency data situations or 
uh, East Coast FlexNet. I mean, there's so many different things occupying there. Then you have your repeater inputs, your simplex frequencies, your repeater outputs. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. And it's very good to learn and break it down. And I'll show you exactly where stuff is. Because you don't want to be using a frequency for voice when it's a packet frequency. Because you may not hear anything there. Because the packet's not that popular anymore, but it's still in use. So you got to make sure you know where you're allowed to talk as a newly licensed or a seasoned professional on two meters. Here's a breakdown of more detailed explanation on what's happening on this entire band from the ARRL.org. Starting here, the lower portion CW, EME. What is EME? That's Earth, Moon, Earth. That's moon bounce. People use two meters to relay Morse code or CW off the surface of the moon back to Earth. And you can make some, that's a whole separate subject, but there are people devoting their entire life making handfuls of contacts on that. That is by far the longest and most epic DX contact you can make. 400,000 mile round trip. Anyway, so that's CW EME. Then you have regular CW here, weak signals. You have beacons on here. Here's your propagation beacons here. So it's a good practice to know what beacons are where. There is one in Orlando, Florida that I know of. And when that beacon, I can hear it, and I want to say it's 14.275, I think is what it is, or 144.275. When I can hear that beacon, I know there's an opening, and we're going to talk about openings a little bit later in this video. The national calling frequency for sideband is 144.200. And you will hear general sideband just above that. You don't have to be on 144.200. So there is a sideband activity out there and there's contests and there's uh, time when sideband doesn't work and there's time when it does work so we'll check that out fm repeater inputs oscar subband so you have uh you know satellite uh, subband here for inputs and uh, inputs and outputs of satellites satellites uh, some of them are fm some of them are sideband directional aero antennas or handheld yagi antennas with a handheld is all you would need to work a satellite on FM, and then more elaborate if you wanted to have a satellite tracker or use something like an 817 for an uplink and an 817 for a downlink on sideband. Um, but you have FM repeater inputs and your right here weak signal and FM simplex. And now these here are kind of like channelized these frequencies here for packet. There are a lot of packet stations out there that you won't hear, but every 10 minutes when they ID um, or send a burst out on these frequencies. I know there's a few in my area on 144.01, uh, 0709. So take note that uh, packets, a whole nother video I'll be doing. FM repeater outputs. I'm not exactly sure what linear translator inputs are. I'm sure somebody's going to comment on that. I've just never done it. Um, another Oscar subband repeater inputs again. And uh, simplex. So your simplex, the national, everybody knows 14652. That's the national calling. And uh, in my area, I hang around sometimes on 14655. There's a group every night on there. South of me is a group on 144. or 146.49, I think. Uh, so you can find people on different groups on Simplex. And that would be generally FM is what they're doing for Simplex FM, whether they're mobile or handheld, no repeater involved. Repeater outputs, more Simplex up here and repeater input. So you see uh, there's places where people frequent and hang out, and there's places where people are doing different things. Um, we're going to talk about sideband radios versus FM here shortly, because sideband radios still go for a pretty dollar, but there are several alternatives using transverters and stuff that we'll show you getting on sideband to meter. DXMaps.com, and another one I'll show you, are a good place to just look at propagation spots or reports that other users have put into the map, as a suggestion on where propagation may be. Now, the best way to know if two meter band is open is to monitor and listen. There are beacons also, but you monitor and listen and you'll definitely know. But there's some other factors that may play and we'll talk about in a second. Seasons and stuff like that. Now, looking at dxmaps.com, if I looked at this map, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot going on, right? maybe a couple call signs that just reported recently. But if I click on, you know, this this map, if you're not familiar, can be used for uh, low frequency to high frequency, all the HF bands, as well as the upper bands, all right? If I go to list, watch this. These are recently today the stations that have reported 
a spot or a contact on two meters. Look at the frequencies they're using, the modes, FT8. If you haven't seen FT8, you can check out my video and plenty of others on that digital mode. Sideband, CW, Whisper, Weak Signal Propagation Reporter, Sideband, CW, and look, JT65 for EME. Remember, Earth, Moon, Earth. So look at the look at the distances on here on tropospheric ducting, tropo, would be 220 miles, 278 miles, 400 miles. I mean, that's 400 miles on sideband, 2 meters. Then you got EME, which is... 5,900 miles, 3,900 miles, and that's not to the Earth, uh, to the moon and back mileage there or distance. That is uh, from his country to his country. So you got 5,900 miles, and that was reported to Logbook of the World. So there are plenty of people that are still operating and using this, okay? And this changes all the time. So it just updated, and uh, those contacts from earlier today are gone. Here is another means of a propagation map that may interest you, and I'll explain it now. If you Google, the link is in the description, but if you Google APRS Mountain Lake, it should bring it to this site. And from my understanding, this is run by a school organization in Minnesota that is monitoring with a system. They're monitoring APRS packets. And if those APRS packets happen to be traveling quite far, the computer picks that up and says, there might be propagation in this area. Looking at this map with the dark red here, you can assume that it's suggesting there may be two meter propagation here based on APRS packets that are being picked up a lot farther than five miles away from their digipeter. Doesn't necessarily mean that people are talking in that area, but definitely worth a try if you're hunting for contacts. Now, in my Facebook page, uh, on my Facebook page, if you haven't liked that yet, you can follow along hamradio.com, uh, facebook.com slash hamradioconcepts. Follow along. I used to post pictures of screenshots of this in the late spring, early summer, when at some point Florida and the entire east coast of the United States would be covered in red, indicating there may be some sort of propagation. And I can tell you from experience that I used to drive to work in my mobile years ago, a Ford Escort, with an antenna drilled through my roof, and I would be driving to work and hear the west coast of Florida holiday repeater coming in full scale, full quieting every morning. And our repeater in our area is the same frequency as the one in holiday. So I couldn't tell if it was the repeater four miles from me or the repeater across the west, uh, west coast of Florida. That's how strong and clear it was. It does happen early in the morning and late in the evening, sometimes during the day. Now, on a simplex group that I frequent sometimes north of me in Melbourne, there's one guy, John KF4PFI, a friend of mine, and he has witnessed, well, I've been in the group talking, and next thing you know, there's an opening some evening where the guys in Jacksonville or Gainesville or a panhandle pop in there. Hey, guys, we hear you out there. The band must be open again. That's on FM. It does happen. You never know when it's going to happen. You get better instances in certain parts of the year. But there have been people that have talked clear across, halfway across the United States or way up the East Coast from Florida to Pennsylvania or Pennsylvania to Alabama on FM and sideband and CW. It does happen. Now, the way VHF, UHF signal propagates for long distance contacts is a lot different than it is on HF. HF, you may have some bands that are affected by sunspots in the summer or nighttime it's open or daytime it's open. Well, VHF, UHF, different. You can have an opening based on a weather event. Let me explain. One time we were in Florida here, and it was uh, just about spring, and there was a cold front that was spanning down like this, and it was approaching you know, toward the southeast. And uh, once it crossed over or get close to my area in Florida, what happens is on the, the inversion, the temperature inversion, one side of the front, the upper atmosphere or the troposphere may be a lot warmer than it is on the other side of the front or 100 miles north of you on the same side of the front. And what happens with the difference in temperature of the surface versus the troposphere and between two contacts can open a rather um, quick or even a long ducting event. You may have heard someone say ducting or tropo or tropospheric ducting. 
So sometimes as weather can change, sometimes the cold fronts can change weather in a matter of four hours. I've seen it happen before where as the cold front approaches, the temperature drops quick. And that could change the the band conditions in an instant, or it may not. But it's a little bit different on VHF, UHF, being that it can be affected by some sort of weather event like a temperature drop that happens over a matter of an hour. Now, if that's not enough, let me back up here and look. There is also an award, I forget the name of the award, someone will post a comment or you can Google it, of the first contact or team from the tip of Newfoundland to United Kingdom over here, or Ireland, I can't remember. But the first contact to get across the pond using no repeaters, no satellites, and no moon bounce with any mode such as sideband, CW, FM, or data gets an award for being the first contact on two meters across, two meters across the pond. There have been partial contacts, but it doesn't count. So these people are running full legal limit with eight Yaggies in an array or a rhombic or a curtain, and they're trying all the time to get across the pond and get that award. So if they've made partial contacts on CW or digital data, eventually it's going to happen. It just needs to be the exact right time and the perfect conditions to do it. But it can happen. It can happen. So check out this site. Link is in the description. And monitor it. Look at it every day. Look at it in the morning. Look at it at night. If the entire East Coast is blanketed in red, try it out. Listen. Set up a schedule with someone you may know that has a Yagi. Face each other and see what happens. It's safe to assume that the yellows here may be one little packet that got picked up by accident or maybe a, a quick instantaneous propagation report and dropped off. But if you see it wide open red, blanketing, it's a good indication you may be able to try it and make a long distance contact on two meters. Here's my antenna that I have for two meters. This is the Cushcraft 13B2. It's a 13 element two meter boomer. You can check out the complete video about that on the internet. Right under that I have the six meter uh, four element loop fed array from high gain. And now you see this antenna on top, the two meters, is oriented vertical right now because I was using that for FM talking north and stuff. But all I have to do is loosen those bolts and flip that thing horizontal. And that's where I'll capture a lot of the sideband action at long distances. Now a lot of people have something like this horizontal for sideband and CW, then they have a vertical up on top of it for FM. You can use this for FM, you can use it for sideband, you can have it horizontal laying down and still work FM. It's just going to be that if everybody on FM is vertical and you're horizontal, you're going to notice a substantial loss. There's a video on my channel as well on that, how I showed the difference between flipping this vertical and horizontal. So uh, that you can check out on my channel as well. But there's a lot of options for antennas. Let me show you a few of them. A lot of people always ask, Eric, what antenna should I get? What's the best two meter antenna I should get? Should I get a dual band or a mono band? Uh, well, it depends on what you want to do, all right? UHF is a video coming up soon, but in the past, I've always recommended diamond because diamond antennas are like a staple when it comes to VHF, UHF antennas, whether it be a mobile or a handheld or a base antenna. In the past, I had a diamond V2000, uh, V2000A, which actually did 2 meters, centime 70 centimeters, and 6 meter FM. And that antenna was great. Um, here's a 6 meter radial here that you tune for minimum SWR, but that's a great antenna. There are a lot of other options that they have, depending on how much you want to spend, how big it is, the gain you're looking at, and such. But let's say you're wanting a sideband antenna. Well, my Cushcraft, the 13B2, is what I have. That's 2 meters only. 13 element, 1.5 kW power handling. But maybe you don't want one as big as what you just saw. Maybe you want a smaller one. Maybe you want a four element or a three element. Three element Yagi is by far the probably most popular from any dealer. But the more elements you have, the longer the antenna, the higher the gain, more directivity. So I chose to get the 13B2 and end it all. 18.5 <laughs> dBi, that's some serious gain. And uh, can be used FM or sideband depending on how you orient it. Now, MFJ does have a selection of antennas as well. This is one that I had that uh, 
I had on my vehicle, which by far was the best mobile antenna I ever had. This was the MFJ 1432. They called it the Rough Rider, I think. And this antenna was 7 eighths wave, and it had, I uh, forget the gain on it, six point, uh, 5 dB gain on 2 meters, 7.6 dB on 70 centimeters. And that was the one I had with my 160 watt amp uh, that I was using. And uh, I would, man, mobile, I was pulling in some serious stations while mobile. And there are variants of that from Diamond and Comet as well. So it depends on what you want to do, what you're looking to spend. I would just recommend that you don't go with a counterfeit Diamond on eBay. eBay does sell a lot of China. China, excuse me, is selling a lot of antennas that look exactly like a Diamond, even with the packaging. But it's not a diamond, so make sure you buy from a reputable dealer. Uh, you don't want to, you know, it could say anything it wants on an antenna on Amazon or eBay. But unless you have the ability to calculate that dB gain and the, you know, performance characteristics of it, you're just throwing your money away. You don't want to get discouraged. You want to buy a really good antenna at a reasonable price and uh, make sure it works. Just Googling EME moon bounce. Look at this. Here's a. 64 15 element Yaggies. 64 15 element Yaggies for EME moon bounce. I mean, look at this. You got people that have various EME moon bounce arrays that are just impressive. And these people are all hunting as many contacts as they can bouncing off the surface of the moon. But it is possible to not have $15,000 of stuff like this. And that's hoping, I'm hoping to do that in the future and show you that I can do it with something like either a used scrap satellite dish or something homemade. The next thing you're going to ask is what kind of radio or how much do I have to spend to get on 2 meter sideband? Because no, the Bofungs and the Chinese radios and all the FM radios from Yesu and Icon will not do sideband. These days to get on sideband, either you have to buy a 25 or 30 year old Icon or Yesu that is exclusive to two meter sideband, but they still run a pretty penny on the used market. Or you can get something like an Icom 7000 or a FT817 or a Kenwood TS2000, a full fledged HF rig that also has VHF, UHF sideband and FM on it. But who wants to spend $800 on a radio like that you can get something called a transverter now I haven't had a transverter yet I've seen them and played with them I haven't owned one yet but this may be the way to go to you now Johnny at signal search k5 ACL um, you've seen me mention him in previous videos he just did a video on a 2 meter transverter by UT5 JCW which is the transverter store .com. And basically what that does is, let's say you had a 10 meter radio or a HF rig. Uh, a lot of people use a 10 meter radio. And through the transverter, you're on, say, 28 megahertz, flat, uh, 28 megahertz on the HF radio. And it's going through the transverter and coming out on 144 megahertz on the outside of the transverter. So it's converting your 10 meter signal to 2 meters. So roughly maybe 28. 200 would be 144.200 you know it converts it and there are a plethora of different transverters for different frequencies let's say you wanted to get on uh, 70 centimeter sideband without having to look for one of those radios you can use right here any type of hf radio that has the 10 meter band and you can transvert it basically to 70 centimeters so it's a really cool concept i hope to have one of these soon to show you this in further detail because now two meters is going to start getting really active here and i want to be a part of that i've never owned a transverter but uh, you can check out johnny's site his link is in the description to explain more detail about it thanks johnny for that and um, that's a transverter something like the icom 271h was a all mode two meter 144 megahertz transceiver so this did sideband, CW, and FM. And again, you're looking at this on a used market. Nothing wrong with buying one used if you can verify it works or you trust the seller or wherever you decide to shop for used. But that's 350 bucks used right here. And that only does two meters. I would love to have one of those instead of having a transverter, but 
for people on a budget that may or may not use it that much, a transverter may be the way to go, unless you have something like an FT817. But that's only five watts. Now you got to run that into an amplifier, which amplifiers are readily available, used, and new. You can buy an amplifier, put that behind the 817, and now have a decent amount of power coming out, maybe 50 to 100 watts or up to 160. Into a Yagi with 18 dB gain like myself, you'd really be a uh, superstar on two meters. And last but not least, when you're talking about VHF and higher frequencies like this, UHF, even in a microwave, coax is probably the most important thing of your system. Now, you can have a lot of power and a real high gain antenna, but if you're feeding it with RG58, you're losing half that power before it gets the antenna. I have a video uh, when I went to Orlando um, and met Messi and Poloni, which MFJ is one of the exclusive dealers for them. Messi and Poloni um, is by far one of the coolest and uh, probably lowest loss coax. You know, I have LMR 400 out there. I have some um, silver plated RG uh, 218, I think it is. And, you know, this, this coax here is a little bit pricey, but it definitely makes a difference when you're talking about minimizing loss getting to your antenna. I have enough here to run to one more antenna. And this stuff is flexible, but it is um, definitely more rigid than something like RG8 uh, X Mini or something like that. It's double and triple shielded with copper foil and copper braid, solid copper all the way through. Something like this will definitely make your power get to the antenna and not being lost in the feed line because that's where you'll lose a lot of your power on higher frequencies like this is poor coax or high loss coax. So make sure you spend the money. On HF, it's not that important, but spend the money on LMR 400 or higher grade coax when you're talking about two meters uh, for any application. Wow, that was a lot to cover in this video. Um, this was a little more than what is two meters, but I hope it brought a little bit of light and educated you as a newly licensed operator or a seasoned expert that's just used two meters for nothing more than a handheld. There's a lot of stuff to do on it, and the time is about now where two meters is going to get a lot hotter. And uh, there are contests out there for two meters. I did like uh, the last year's contest. I made about 20, 20 something contacts on sideband across Florida and, um, and on FM as well. There are people that don't have sideband, so on contest days, they just use Simplex FM or CW. So it definitely uh, is a, a really cool band. Loops, two, uh, two meter loops are also phenomenal from what I've heard. Depends on where you get it or what it's made out of or who makes it or if you make your own. A two meter loop for horizontal is definitely a real good antenna for two meter sideband if you don't have room for a Yagi. Check out a two meter loop online. Check out all my other videos on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching, enjoying this content. Give me a thumbs up for the effort on the video. Make sure you subscribe and more on the way. From KJ4YZI. Seven three.